America, my name is Armio Sefran Pong. I come to you from the road today, but usually Thursday about this time. Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Trouble in Mind by Leon Litwick. I picked this up uh, a few days ago and I've been reading it. It's excellent. Once again, Trouble in Mind by Leon Litwick. It's a story of black people in the Jim Crow South, black, black Southerners in living in the age of Jim Crow is the subtitle. And Litwack is fantastic because he just details with such perspicacity, such carefulness of, of like both white cultural institutions and their commitment to keep black people in their place after they were, you know, according to the constitution equal. Right. So, the you know, the whites have a lot invested in keeping black people in their place, especially in the, in the South, where there are just so many black people. I mean, it, he says in the time of Mississippi, there are more black people than white people. Right. So the idea, and, you know, and in Georgia, where I'm not right now, but where I usually call home, Georgia is about a third black. So actually, if black people were to have a third of, for example, the commercial real estate, Georgia would be markedly different. The white way of life, the Southern way of life would be non-existent because it depends on the vulnerability, dependence, asymmetrical dependence, and and degradation of black communities. Sure, you're going to have a handful of black individuals with money, but they're allowed to have and keep money by... Uh, making sure that they go along with the program of white supremacy at the community level, right? So after, after the Civil War and after Reconstruction, the whites still needed black vulnerability and black labor, but they couldn't, they wouldn't share power with them, right? And in Mercer Baradon's book, The Color of Money, you get the story about how that's led to black poverty today. In this book, you get the story of how that's led to this more wider spread black cultural and institutional degradation. For even our HBCUs have always been about accommodation and survival, accommodation and survival. And if you're always worried about accommodating white whims and surviving their violence, you're not actually self-determining. You're not actually free. So even the HBCUs, the schools that the whites allowed us to have, have always been trained on teaching the kinds of blacks who concern themselves with accommodation and survival. Those two words, accommodation and survival. And not on actually working on the whites, going to war with the whites. Because look, progress is only going to come when black people get their cut of assets and social opportunities, not just political votes, but assets and social opportunities. And that's going to come by taking them from the whites. So if you're not actually preparing black people to take what's theirs from the whites, who are right now not the best custodians of black wealth, you need, uh, you're, you're just teaching your black communities to accommodate themselves to the whites' ill-gotten gains, right? So once again, the perfect audience for this book is like, I think, I mean, this is a book you can give to high schoolers about why blacks are so degraded. But I, I, I think, and for example, like I said, The Color of Money, Russell Broderon's book is an excellent book to give to high schoolers or college students if they need to understand why blacks are so poor, as opposed to the standing narratives that they're just somehow like, like a decrepit people. But like, no, how America made black poor. The Color of Money by Russell Broderon is actually a good intro book for that. This is a good intro book for how a white culture has made black people degraded. The violence of white culture and the terror when white terrorism has made black people and their institutions degraded. The kinds of institutions black people are allowed to have are those that accommodated the whims of, of the racial order. The, the the dominant group of the racial order, which is the, the, the whites, right? So just the idea that you can't be about accommodation and survival and harmony and also be about black progress. I'll say this again. You cannot be about accommodation, survival, and a superficial racial harmony and also be about black progress because accommodation and survival uh, and even the, the appearance of racial harmony is only going to come 
the whites will only let that come if black people allow themselves to be degraded and continue to allow themselves to be degraded. There's going to be, it took a civil war to get us out of chains, right? So like it took disharmony. It's going to take a lot of disharmony. It's going to take a lot of violence, honestly, um, to deal with, you know, the entitlements of the whites, right? And so this book does a great job of actually detailing those entitlements of the whites the, the, and also the degradation and kind of like the development of the degradation from the first time you realize that maybe life isn't fair and just and that people are lying to you to maybe you realize that you can get out but you have to leave your community to do it and then maybe the, and then you eventually realize that if none of us are free unless we're all free and we're all not going to be free unless we learn how to fight the whites right so some of you guys who are watching this video haven't made it yet by the way if you appreciate what i'm doing go ahead and go to www.funkyacademic.com kick in five fifteen or fifty dollars a month and i'll just keep kind of keep doing what i'm doing giving you the kind of game you need once again trouble in mind right so it's a it's a mix between the color of money and uh the warmth of other suns you put those two books together and you get i feel like the trouble in mind because it does do a good job of explaining both white pathology and like the black response to white pathology which is like build our institutions in terms of accommodation and survival all right the let us educate our people but we have to promise that we, they, we can't teach them too much so that they won't want to pick cotton. So we have to give them like, we have to uh, inculcate them with like industri industry and thrift and uh, let them know that it's good for them to pick cotton and not actually own anything, right? And then there are some people say like, well, we'll give them industrial education, but not so much that they can compete with us, <laughs> right? So we have, to, uh, we have to give them the quality of industrial education so that they're helpful, but make sure they're starved of assets so that they don't compete, right? Because we can't have them competing with us, right? So like this dance that black institutions have to um, kind of perform because black people were made to not own anything and not control anything and not be able to defend anything is 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 the whole is the whole game right and if you don't dance that dance in black people we can't dance that dance and be free there is no secret freedom you got to live out loud or you're not really free and you have to live out loud helping other black people get their cut or you're not really free you can't live out loud but have it be really personal like you have your nice car and your nice house and you're completely indifferent to the struggles of American descendants of slaves. That's not freedom. That's one rich Negro, <laughs> right? Um, that's, that's like the Obama. That's not, if you call that black excellence, then that's not an excellence that's black. That's a personal excellence that's capitalist. Actually, and oh, by the way, in defense of capitalism, people don't understand. I'm not an anti-capitalist. I believe in capitalism. I just think that assets need to be distributed among all people if we're going to have the economic and social conditions in order for political democracy. So you can't have um, a capitalist system where the only people who own things are like whites, right? You can't have a capitalist. You can't have a capitalist democracy that includes black people, but black people don't own anything because. In our degradation, in our lack of assets, and in our debt and dependency, that will be used in order to distort any of our political participation. Right. So you can't be a, a, you can't be politically free, but in but asymmetrically dependent and in debt and all in crushing debt in all aspects of your life because you're not going to participate in the political process in a way that will actually offend the people who own your debt. Right? So if you're scared of ticking off your boss, you're not exactly politically free because you can't actually say what you want. Right? I, I did a video before about my defense of public voting because I think people should be accountable for their votes. And the reason why we like secret ballots is we don't need the whites to know how we vote individually. We don't want people to know how we vote because we're not actually free. 
if we were actually free, we'd be able to stand up and say, I voted for so-and-so for this, for these reasons. But we're not free, so we need to hide our votes. And that's a problem. So we don't have the social and political, the social and civil conditions of political freedom. We just have the vote, which is then a social and civil degradation, and to a certain extent our family degradation too, um, is used in order to control our political participation. We're allowed to vote, but not allowed to run. We're allowed to run, but we're only allowed to run and talk on these on these issues, not those issues. Uh, before I talked about Raphael Warnock, isn't allowed to talk about reparations because it might tick off the whites and how he's pretty much as useless as anybody else. It doesn't matter if you're a black face. If you're not allowed to talk about the, the policies that will make black people, black working class people whole uh, because they might tick off the whites, then you're not really free, right? And so this whole ideology about how we can be free but not, but not in a way that ticks off the whites is given really kind of a hard granular detail in this book. So I, I suggest all the whites read this. Um, it's more important than white fragility. I, I, you know, black people, give this to your high schooler. Give this to your junior high schooler. I will definitely give this to my kids once on their 12th birthday. And since I'm like a dad who knows what they're doing, I'm going to make sure they read it <laughs> with inducements. Um, uh, and you will just know the perfidy and what it means to try to kind of build black institutions. And uh and in America, that is hostile to black independent power. That means the only kind of institutions you can build if you're black are going to be those that the whites approve of, right? You expect an HBC. Right now, Mackenzie Scott, also known as Mackenzie Bezos, is the most powerful person, the most powerful Negro in, in America because she decides what HBCUs will do. Because no HBCUs is going to do anything that's going to get on the other side of Mackenzie uh, Scott, Mackenzie Bezos. Because she writes the checks, right? She's Jeff Bezos' wife. She writes zillion dollar checks to HBCUs and everywhere else. But since we don't actually um, have real money, the fact that she writes checks to everybody, including HBCUs, it's, it's, it's not that big of a deal to everybody else, but it's a huge deal to HBCUs. Not that big of a deal to her, but a huge deal to HBCUs. And so we think that like we're special. <laughs> because we get a pittance. And that's a problem. Right. So Leon Litwick's, Leon Litwick's back, Trouble in Mind, a book, Trouble in Mind, goes into really just hard detail about the cultural formation of the whites and what that cultural formation does to, uh, you know, black people in a place where we are titularly or constitutionally free, but really in subordination because we don't own um, they control what we learn when we learn it, and since they control the adult life that we live into, they control the preparation for that adult life that we must live into, right? Because, you know, they do a whole chapter about how one of the problems with teaching Black people how to be free, one of the worries that both the Black community and the white community has is that they might want to fight back and not just be okay with the degradation that a lot of black people have, have kind of eked out a living with, right? They might want to fight back. And then what happens? And so if you really want your child to be comfortable and happy, you teach them to be okay with subordination under the whites. Or you teach them to leave the whites alone, which only works at a certain level um, uh, because, like, since they take up so much public space, you can't just live your life without having to deal with the whites. At some level of success, you're going to have to deal with the whites. So the question is, are you going to kowtow to them, or are you, have you been trained to actually fight them? And that's not something you can just pick up as an adult. It's something, it's a skill that needs to be enculturated um, in you. And, like, you need to know why it's going to be a fight, right? Because you're fighting lineages. Right? You're not fighting a race, you're fighting a lineage. And a lineage is a line that only makes sense um, relative to other lines. So in order for their lines to be able to tell the story about uh, their grandfathers and grandmothers that they need to tell, 
and to be able to pass on their perks to their granddaughters and grandsons, they need your line to um, to to kind of maintain the standing order of degradation, right? So the white line, the white lineage, depends on the degradation of the black lineage because if black people and their, and their futures actually are bright and we do progress, the white lineage is threatened because their grandkids are not going to enjoy the same relative perks as, as they do, right? So that's what they're fighting for. We're fighting people trying to protect their lineage. They're trying to protect the memory of their grandparents and the prospects of their grandchildren. And if we actually want to defend both the memory of our grandparents, but also the prospect of our grandchildren, we need to go to war against their lineage. Right? It's a lineage war, and this is one of the, uh, the weapons we need. This book, Trouble in Mind, is one of the weapons we need generally diffused in order to fight the lineage war and get our cut from those little adorable little white grandbabies who are going to have to work, <laughs> although their grandparent was like a terrorist. But so, um, yeah, yeah. So it's a lineage struggle, and we're going to have to take the food off of white grandkids' plates, and that's fine. Um, and we need to have the arguments ready for that. We need to understand the, the history of, of racial terrorism that has led to both Black financial degradation and Black cultural degradation, that we don't own our own institutions. The churches are what they are because those are the churches the whites let us have. Our seminaries are what they are because those are the seminaries the whites let us have. The schools are what they are because those are the schools and the books and the stories that the whites allowed us to have. And we don't have the conditions of autonomy, autonomy because we don't own and I have the independent financial resources and the legal resources to secure our financial resources um, uh, in the black community, and we were made dependent. And we're not going to get independent individually. You don't get independent individually because of this, this scale involved, right? So there is no pooling your money together to get, to get rid of black debt, right? If we pool our money together, we can't even we can't even make sure the lead is out of our pipes, right? So, yeah. So, Trouble in Mind by Leon Litwack, fantastic book. Give it to your mama. Give it to your kids. And it's just it's really just well clearly written, um, and I think it's a good intro book to the kind of the state of play. And what black people need. I even think it's better than for, for Here to Equality from um, Sandy Darity's book. Uh, I think you read The Color of Money, you read The Trouble of Mind first, and then from Here to Equality, like once you're committed uh, to, like, all right, we, what, what do we do to like, actually get our cut? And also, I like Danielle Allen's book, Education and um, Equality, because that book shows that, look, a real education is an education into wielding power. And a real education into wielding power against a population, the whites, who don't want to share power, means an education into fighting the whites for power. Right? And if you're not educated in fighting the whites, and you're not serious about that aspect of the education, then you're just doing accommodation and survival, and you're not really serious about freedom. Right. So real education is going to be an education in fighting the whites for the power that they think is theirs. Right. And you need kind of, I don't know, you need books for that. You need knowledge and you need arguments. You need to account for why black people don't own in the American South. Or why even a lot of black grandparents and great-grandparents own, but their kids are in public housing. Like their kids don't know what happened. Well, this is what happened. Right. Like, the whites regrouped and fought the long civil war um, in, in a different, by different means. All right. So thank you for your time. If you appreciate what I'm doing, go ahead and go to www.funkyacademic.com. Go out and get Leon's Litwax book, The Trouble in Mind. Um, yeah, and it's just well put together. 
and uh, I will see you next week. Peace.